Hello, it's nice to be here today with all of you. So I'm going to take the perspective. We've been talking about worldwide issues, and I'm going to bring the perspective a little bit closer to the United States and even more specifically to the San Francisco office. Um, we've been talking about different situations and laws in different countries. And uh, under for asylum cases, the under Tobazo Alfonso that Neil mentioned, that the, um, the Attorney General certified to herself and made the decision in the 90s that, uh, in the language of the case, homosexuals were a particular social group. And more recently in the Ninth Circuit, not too many years ago, in the, in the case of Karuni, that was again uh, reiterated saying that in case we've not made ourselves clear, we affirm that all alien homosexuals are members of a particular social group. That is an incredible hurdle to go over. Most folks who want to make the claim that they are part of a particular social group don't have case law that says, yes, you are a member of a particular social group. So this is, uh, it, 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 it makes the start out of the case much more direct, and you can you can plunge right into your case without having to convince someone that you're eligible under one of the categories because you are. It's it's already a, a stipulated that you are. Um, in looking at the cases, what I want to do is go through some of the issues as they actually would come up in an asylum case. As so though you were the uh, representative preparing the case and in the order of the case. So one of the first um, hurdles that everybody has to go through is the one-year rule bar. That's the, you've got to get over that or you're not eligible. And of course, the one-year bar is that you have to file within one year of entry. So that's going to rule out many, many people. And so there are, of course, exceptions to that. So we've got the exception of changed circumstances and the exception of extraordinary circumstances. So what would we look at, typically, what do we see in LGBT cases? Uh, for change circumstances, just like in all cases, if there's a, a change in the country of origin, that could be a change circumstance, which would then give you more time to have come forward and filed. You may have, as Neil has talked about the sort of last cases, you may have come out in the United States, got another. That's a possibility for a change of circumstance. So again, um, the time is extended in which you can file. You may be here and you may have once here or after being here for a number of years, receive an HIV diagnosis. Now you've got it, you have a change circumstance. Again, can extend the time in which you can file. Each case is looked at individually. So the, it's, it's important in preparing a case that you consider this and, and have, you consider it, have the information ready for the officer, have your client ready to speak to the circumstance. Extraordinary circumstances, now we have the second category, and most often what we see under extraordinary circumstances is something that has come about because of the trauma suffered. So you may have clients who are suffering under PTSD conditions, you may have folks who have been very depressed based on their situation. Some of the most horrific harm that we see in asylum cases are in these cases, in the LGBT context. So we are, we are ready to, to learn that there have been situations such as uh, depression or an illness that kept someone from being able to file. Now, Ignorance of the law itself is not is not sufficient. So just saying, well, I didn't know about it, is not, unfortunately, is not sufficient. So you need to look at other circumstances in your client's life if you want to bring it, want to get past that one year hurdle when your client's been here for longer than a year. Neil was talking about um, assessing credibility. So what do we do in the asylum context to assess credibility? Well, it's, it really is the same as with any group, whether you're talking about having been persecuted because of your religion or political opinion, you're going to go through very similar 
uh, requirements. And so, as Neil mentioned, and there is the Real ID Act, and the Real ID Act says that if there's documentation available, and the applicant should have it, it's reasonably available to them, then they need to present it, or the officer can ask for it, and they need to present it. So, what would the what would documentation be in this context? What we would look for are things like letters from friends. If your client is still in touch with their family, letters from family, uh, affidavits, photos, membership in groups, that uh, LGBT groups active in, in these groups, and being able to talk about that as well at the interview. So we're, we're not looking for a sheet of paper that says, you know, so-and-so is LGBT. That's, that's not what we're looking for. But we're looking for things that can cooperate, corroborate, and support the claim. If if a person, if it's not reasonable for them to get any of these sorts of letters, or if there are no people that su that can support them and can help them in this way, you know that under Ninth Circuit law, credibility based on credible testimony will do. So um, we look for that kind of documentation, it, it helps your client, may make it easier for them in the interview even. But if you don't have it, then we will discuss with we'll discuss the case with your client. This is something that adjudicators uh, sometimes, I don't want to say often, but sometimes see where the applicant comes in and it, it would appear that they've not had sufficient preparation to be able to talk about what has happened to them. And we all know and respect that this is very difficult for the applicant, but the adjudicator is in the position that they have to ask the questions. And so the more that you can work with someone to try to feel comfortable in the interviewing context, it's nobody's saying you're going to feel comfortable, but that they can talk about it, that they have some understanding of what we're going to ask them about. So preparation for that. For instance, someone maybe who is coming in now um, with an issue, maybe an HIV diagnosis, but they've had harm in the past as a child. For, for many folks, this is, and I think Neil was mentioning this, it's very, very difficult to talk about that, to, to, bring, to bring that out. And we have had cases where there has been harm in childhood, and we had to sometimes bring a person back two or three times because the first time around they weren't able to really talk about it. And so we will we will try to do that. And sometimes folks, in if they're seeing someone and they're in therapy, they can help them with that. You can ask us. We will get extra time because obviously one session or two sessions is probably not going to be enough. And so we will postpone the interview to give them time to go through that process, and then they will also have a written report from the therapist if that's what, what they chose. We also, another thing that comes up under the credibility context is that what we see sometimes, and we understand completely that it's well-meaning, uh, but sometimes we see declarations or documents prepared where in discussing the LG, uh, GTP, uh, sorry issues, the person will, the um, representative will sometimes fall back on stereotypes, um, even if it doesn't necessarily apply to their client. And we assume that's because they think that that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the stereotypical uh, issues. And, and in fact, the asylum officers are not trained that way. They are, tra they are trained to look for the differences because they're trained to look at case by case, not at a generalization. So if that's something that you feel you want to do for your client, we would recommend that you don't. And just to give us their story, because no two stories you know are alike. And we don't expect, there's no expectation that they would be. So that sometimes can get in the way of, of credibility if then your client feels that they have to support what it says in their declaration and that may not be exactly correct. So we look for that, too. Um, the harms. The harms are, are, the list is long, and, and Neil went through quite a few of them. The you know, death, the criminal penalties, 
Uh, in, our, in our particular office, we see two um, groupings of harm, primarily. Um, one is rape and sexual violence, um, where folks are, are threatened, other folks by their behavior, by who they are, and so they are harmed because of that, whether it's rape by um, <coughs> the, the saddest thing, of course, is uh, the children who are raped by teenagers, uh, or the police. Um, we see we see that probably most often. We, we also see beatings, and torture, inhumane treatment from family, family members. Those are probably the two biggest categories of the cases that that we see here in, in our office. And we do have the <coughs> largest caseload of the eight asylum offices. Um, there's, there are other issues, forced marriage, forced psychiatric treatment, and, and discrimination, harassment, economic harm. We see these, and they, sometimes they're part of these other cases, but primarily we see the harm experienced as children and then harm from family members. Uh, in, in the interview itself, the a, a few folks have mentioned that um, that it is sometimes difficult to speak about what has happened, or if they come out in the U.S., or if they are feeling shame about their experience. And it, it is very difficult, and it is very traumatic. There is quite a bit of training that's given to the asylum officers. I can't tell you that 100% of asylum officers are, are are going to be, you know, that, that everyone is equally gifted. In, in working with with people and helping them through the interview, getting through the trauma. But there is quite a bit of training about that. There is also quite a bit of training about country conditions that Roy will go over with you. Um, and we, officers are trained to accommodate the applicant. So if there's difficulty, if, we, if, we, if you need to stop, if your client needs to stop, if they need to gather themselves, if they perhaps can't continue their interview on that day, and they need to reschedule and come back on another day. We will work with them and accommodate them in those situations because it, we understand how how difficult it is. We we hear our whole lives is based on hearing very difficult stories from people. And although we get you know we have to toughen up a little bit over time, uh, we still we're there because we want to be there and we want to help. Um, Again, I have my little practice point about preparing your, your client for, for the experience as well. So in our, in our own caseload at San Francisco, our, our caseload is a little over 3,000 cases a year, and 5 to 10% of those are the LGBT cases. Um, they, the caseload is primarily a male caseload. I would say probably 90% male. Um, and most of the, again, the um, majority of our cases come from Mexico. Of that, of that group, and probably about 70 to 80 percent are cases from Mexico. <coughs> the other percentage come they, from all over, all over the globe. Uh, Latin America, of course, but also the Middle East, uh, Asia. So we do see cases from just about everywhere. But the vast majority are. Uh, the Mexican cases. Um, I'm, I am open to questions if you if you have them before moving on to Roy's presentation, or if you want to wait until the end. I don't know how you want to do it. Yes. Can you talk about how you handle the issue of well, couldn't they just go to Mexico City where it's not only okay to be gay, it's okay to get married? How do you deal with the regional disparities? Well, you know. It, that isn't really our consideration because uh, our, our, our information regarding country conditions is that that, that, wouldn't, that there's no guarantee of anything like that for anyone. And especially in some of the folks that, that we see that just wouldn't have the wherewithal to, to do that, either economically or just from their experience because of what they've been through. So that isn't really something that we consider for the Mexican cases. I have a question about, um, in most cases, usually we're looking at persecution by the state or non-state actors. Uh, and in LGBT cases, you mentioned a little bit, you talked about, um, 
the inability that many LGBT people have in, in, in getting education or work in their country, what percentage of the inability to you know to do that, the economic part of your your plan is valid in the asylum plan, is that taken into account? The fact that the person cannot find a job or the only jobs available be for transgender people, for example, prostitution or that right. sort of thing. How, how much of that weighs the input into an application? Well, and that falls under discriminatory treatment. So it would. You know, discrimination by itself is usually not sufficient, but cumulatively it can be. So you would want to look at all areas of that person's life and how that's affected them. So it's, it's very possible that you could have a success, a success with the plan. Okay, then I will bring it over to Roy. Good morning. Uh excited to be here and really glad that uh, Neil and Rachel and Warren have invited me and, and Amelia to be a part of this panel. Uh, it's exciting to talk about our work uh, with the uh, Refugee Asylum International Operations Directorate and uh, I think this is a really important conference and, and I'm really glad to be here. I work in Washington at uh, USCIS headquarters and I specifically oversee a research unit uh, that produces country conditions information on a broad range of issues. So it's not just LGBT, I, but um, we look at a uh, broad range of issues that uh, asylum cases uh, uh, have to work through. So, uh, but this is an area which I spend a lot of time on. Uh, it's an area of uh, uh, particular interest to me. Um, and so I'm really excited to be here. So what I'm going to try and do um, is not so much um, repeat uh, some of the things that have already been said and probably will be said afterwards. I'm really going to try and focus as much as I can on uh, the role of country conditions information uh, within uh, the adjudication process. So um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, but I'll try and go through this pretty quickly uh, to give you a sense of how we do our work. Okay, so uh, the Radio <coughs> Research Unit supports the needs of the uh, entire Refugee Asylum International Operations Directorate uh, within USCIS, and we have uh, approximately six researchers. Uh, myself, the Chief of the Research Unit, Andrew McIntosh, who covers Sub-Saharan Africa, David Tarr, covers Europe, CIS, Central Asia, including Afghanistan and Pakistan. Bill Corner, who handles East Asia, Juan Bultovac, the Middle East, but also specializes on transnational gangs. Cynthia Vega, who handles Latin America. Ryan Littlepage, who handles the Horn of Africa. We also employ three part-time uh, experts who uh, also assist us on special projects. So, um, you know, as you know, this is a, a global phenomenon. Uh, we really do try and uh, provide what's known as fast and reliable to a lot to uh, asylum adjudicators across the uh, country. Uh, and we try and give them a sense of the, uh, the, the broad variety of, of issues out there. Uh, some of these have already been uh, sort of spoken to, but here they are again. Some of the issues which we alert uh, our adjudicators to, extrajudicial killings, torture and ill-treatment, sexual assault and rape, invasions of privacy, arbitrary detention, uh, denial of employment and education, blackmail and extortion. And uh, this is not an exhaustive list, so this is just something just to give you a, a sense of um, some of the issues that uh, that we do follow. Uh, when I showed this list around, one of the uh, the uh, 
uh, NGO uh, representatives that I, I look to for, for guidance. Also suggested that we talk about um, uh, structural violence against LGBT people. Um, and you referred to this as essentially when the state really doesn't um, actively uh, you know, throw you in jail or persecute you, but obviously they've made it so difficult uh, for you to live your life and that you're essentially living in constant fear. Uh, there's no legal violation that's taken place or has been committed by the state, um, but uh, you essentially are, are, are hemmed in. Um, you uh, are, are living in, a, as you said, a, a constant state of fear and anxiety. And he refers to this as structural violence against LGBT people. Uh, I have these pictures here. Uh, you probably, maybe some of you are familiar with them. Uh, the one on uh, your left is uh, the Rolling Stone article, which is from Uganda, in which uh, this newspaper, if you want to call it that, um, listed or pictured 100 Ugandans. Uh, who they identified as homosexual. I'm not even sure that all of them were homosexual, uh, but that's not appearing there. What happened is they, um, out of these people, they uh, charged them with being homosexual. And it really created a very charged atmosphere within Uganda. And one of the persons that's pictured in this uh, uh, cover photo is uh, the activist David Cato, who was killed, I believe, earlier this year in Uganda. Picture on uh, the right is uh, a picture of two young men, I believe, who were accused of uh, rape or homosexuality. I'm not sure what the, the charge was. Um, but uh, what's so shocking about it is really the, the, the age of, of, of these uh, individuals. They look to be at least you no know, more than 16 or 17. Um, this was uh, from Iran. And then this is just a little roundup. And again, this is not exhaustive. These are just some of the um, somewhat recent uh, events that have taken place in various uh, regions around the world. Um, here uh, in Africa, as it says, more than two thirds of African countries have laws criminalizing homosexual acts. Uh, here in Honduras and Latin America, gay rights activist was killed by unknown assailants in a drive-by attack. His death, was, his death was the 16th known murder in the Honduran LGBTI community since uh, last year's military coup. In the Middle East, I'm sure many of you are aware of the attacks against uh, gay men in Iraq. Human Rights Watch released a 67-page report documenting extra extrajudicial judicial executions, kidnappings, and torture of gay men in Iraq. And the HR report was titled, They Want Us Exterminated, Reports Directly Fears About the Third Sex and the Feminization of Men. Um, I was also recently informed about another HRW report recently published on LGBT rights in Iran, and that's titled, We Are a Buried Generation. Uh, this report, I believe, was also supported by the International Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission. I haven't seen this report, but I'm going to look for it. And again, it's called uh, We Are a Buried Nation, and focuses on Iran. <coughs> All right, um, let's see. What I want to do quickly, instead of just sort of focusing on some of these things that are happening around the world, because I think you're pretty familiar with them, I'm going to go to the country conditions information um, pretty quickly, sort of see if we can get to that. This is helpful, though. This is, um, I wanted to put out a slide about the research methodologies that we use. Uh, we use publicly available information, compare multiple sources and identify sources as precisely as possible. These are some of the factors that go into assessing our sources, relevance, clarity, comprehensiveness, availability. Uh, we try and uh, screen out for bias. 
timeliness, qualification of the source, and reliability of the source. This is how it's used, COI, in the adjudication process. Used in pre-interview preparation by asylum officers, refugee officers, uh, during the interview to probe credibility, and used during the decision making to support the decision. <coughs> Here are some search terms. I put those in just in case it might be helpful to you when you're looking for country conditions information. You want to use as many search terms as possible. Um, and these are, you know, again, this is not an exhaustive list, but um, uh, helpful when you're searching, say, uh, various databases such as Rep World. Um, uh, you might, uh, again, want to use as many, many. Uh, sources as possible, many times as possible. All right, sources for country conditions information. These are some that I turn to. Um, the adjudicator bodies, adjudicator bodies for the UN uh, reporting bodies, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Inter-American Court on Human Rights, European Court on Human Rights, uh, State Department. Many of you know that the State Department is charged with um, reporting on uh, the status of LGBT people, and um, uh, it's getting better and better each year. Um, and I would uh, certainly encourage you to use that as a really jumping off point when you're looking for country conditions information. It's not exhaustive, it's not as detailed as you'd like, but uh, given uh, the, the problems with finding good country uh, uh, conditions information, there really is no probably better source to start off with at least. Uh, than the uh, State Department's annual country reports. And then, of course, human rights organizations do a lot of reporting. I wanted to talk very quickly about this uh, resolution uh, that just passed last week. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but the UN uh, Human Rights Council uh, passed a resolution on LGBT issues. And this is really important. I'm just going to just very quickly um, mention a couple of things which I think um, uh, are really are noteworthy about this particular resolution. Um, <coughs> it is the first resolution uh, to address sexual orientation, sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, it is a resolution that has, it has the backing of the council and it's not a statement and there needs to be a big, I think, um, separation with understanding what a, what a resolution does in comparison to a uh, statement. Um, statements really do have the full backing of the, uh, the UN and the body, and they ask the UN to do something. Statements sort of generally take a position on a particular issue, but the resolutions really um, ask for the UN and member states and the body to take some sort of action. And so one of the things that I think is really important about this is that what's going to come out of it is going to be um, a reporting mechanism, or at least um, a report on uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, the inclusion of gender identity is really important because it acknowledges the vulnerability of trans people. And this is kind of new. We really haven't seen this before. So um, again, I, I encourage you to take a look at this, this uh, UN Human uh, Rights Council resolution. New sources and tools. Um, uh, we're still exploring uh, where this will come in in terms of documentation issues for us, Twitter, Facebook, and, and so forth. But uh, I'm working with my European colleagues um, who uh, head up uh, uh, research units within their uh, organizations, and we're, we're looking at uh, Twitter and Facebook and whatnot. And then finally, I just want to just touch briefly on the Universal Periodic Review. And um, again, I see that as a really important source for um, the uh, preparation of country conditions information to help adjudicators, to help lawyers, advocates uh, do documentation. So I encourage you to look to the U Universal Periodic Review, or also known just as UPR. <laughs> Um, find documents, information to help you uh, with your cases. And if you
you want to talk later, um, I'm happy to give you the sites and, and tell you how to access some of these some of these programs. Thank you.